I'll speak about Islam on television, and that is, of course, a, a very important subject in the sense that people uh, in the Muslim world generally, and certainly in the Arab world, they do spend a lot of their time watching television. In many, many homes, television would be running all day. Uh, and uh, like in the States, many, many homes would have more than one TV set. Uh, so a lot of the information, but also entertainment, values and other things that people get these days come from television. But that's actually a novelty, as you know. By 1960, there was hardly any television in the Arab world. It had just begun. So this is something that has taken place within two generations. And we can all foresee that it's not going to be like that in the next generation either. Um, and in those two generations, I would like to point to the fact that in the first generation, that is, in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, people could typically only watch one or two channels, state channels. More or less the way we know it from Denmark, but not the way you would know it from the United States. Um, here's, so it's 50 years of television, more or less. This is from Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, which uh, when the first photo was taken was actually the capital of Saudi Arabia. But it just illustrates that this is, has been a major investment by all the states um, because it, they all could see just how important it was to reach a population, a population which in many cases in 1960 was uh, illiterate to a very high degree. And you'd still find that in, for instance, in the Yemen or in Morocco. Uh, illiteracy is still uh, an important phenomenon in the Arab world and that makes radio and television all the more important in comparison to newspapers for instance. Um, when I begin with Saudi Arabia it's also just to register that Saudi Arabia was the only place where television really ran into religious complaints and criticism and attempts at banning television in the 1960s, especially by the Mufti of Saudi Arabia, Ibn Baez, uh, who didn't want television. He was blind. I'm not hinting that this is a reason. Um, but he was, even by, by Saudi standards, a very, very conservative man. And in 1979, people who considered themselves his disciples uh, laid siege to the Haram Mosque in Mecca. And uh, one of their demands was that the, tele uh, that the kingdom ban television again. They didn't succeed in that. Television is hugely popular in Saudi Arabia. Here you see uh, a man who died not so long ago. His name is Mustafa Mahmoud. He was one of the first to have a full Islamic program on television. This was an Egyptian television. The man, uh, a former medical doctor, who also established a very big clinic complex uh, in Cairo, uh, got a weekly program where he would uh, tell about uh, modern science and Islam and how those two are not in contradiction, but how modern science proves Islam in some sort of a creationist way, you might say. That made him very popular. And this was just the kind of Islam that the Egyptian cultural elite, not very uh, devout necessarily itself, would like for its population. By the 1960s and 70s, Islam was growing in importance, especially from the 1970s onwards. And many people were not too happy about that. Many people in the elite, um, in a place like Egypt, um, you've all heard about the Muslim Brotherhood, but there were also other uh, awakening movements. They talked about the awakening as Sahwa in Egypt in the 1970s and this has in a way continued until this day. The question then would be how would the people who control television, state television, respond to this? For a long time they didn't do much. They wanted to use television to lead people to think about something else. So they would show, for instance, the famous football matches between Al Ahli and Zamalek on Fridays so that people might not go so much to mosque, for instance, and so on. So initially there was this idea that television could somehow compete with religion, but soon they realized that uh, it probably couldn't 
and it would be better to strengthen certain understandings of religion via television. They began, for instance, to introduce the call to prayer, the Adhan, uh, as a break on television. You wouldn't have that in, in the 1960s anywhere. Uh, actually, in the 1960s, there, wasn't, there was hardly any religion on television. Uh, there would be certain annual events, uh, like the Eid, uh, the, the Khutbat al-Eid, the special uh, sermon after the Eid, but not much else. Television was seen as something just very much apart from religion. Now this has changed when we moved to the second generation of television, the one that began around 1990. And the main reason is satellite. By now, no state controls what its population will be watching on TV. And this is actually a very, very important development in the Arab world. Uh, this is my own view from my office in Al Ahram, an Egyptian newspaper where I uh, worked for a couple of years. Uh, so you can see everybody has got satellite, even in a poor country like uh, Egypt. I think I brought another one as well. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's how it looks, and it looks like this in the Yemen. It looks like this in Tunis. It looks like this in Iraq. All over the place, people began to get their own satellite dishes because they wanted to watch something else, not what the state was serving. And uh, some of the things they could watch in the be beginning were Arab channels set up in Europe, in London and Paris and Rome, uh, by businessmen who could see that this has a huge potential. But if we set it up in our own country, it will be completely directed by the Secret Service and censorship and so on, we'll need to go to Europe and beam it into the region. This began after the Gulf War uh, in 1990, when the Arabs could see how much CNN could do. Uh, the CNN could cover that war, both from the Kuwaiti side and from the Iraqi side with a split screen. You are not old enough to realize just how marvelous this was to the rest of us who had grown up with. <laughs> Uh, with television. These kind of innovations, uh, Arab states were very quick to copy them, uh, but most of the states would simply upgrade their own national terrestrial television onto satellite. They weren't very imaginative, but those businessmen who set up channels in Europe, they began to offer more interesting, big shows, other things, uh, and uh, that's what people wanted. So they abandoned their state television in search of something more entertaining for the most part, but also soon more enlightening. Um, so this is a new Arab television with weakened state control. Of course, the states try to influence what people watch, but they can no longer monopolize what people watch. Um, and another interesting aspect is that it's pan-Arab. That means that people from Morocco to Iraq can watch the same channels. And even people, Arabs living in, for instance, in Europe, who had for two generations been pretty far away from the Arab world, media-wise, now they could reconnect, and they did. All those uh, satellite dishes, you could also see them in uh, immigrant uh, districts in Paris or London or uh, uh, Berlin or wherever. And again, this meant that people had access not to two or three channels, but to hundreds. And they would simply choose with a remote control what they'd like to see. So suddenly some sort of consumer-driven uh, momentum came in, said you'd have to offer something people would like. If the Moroccan king insisted that every newsreel uh, should begin with whoever he had had visiting, a foreign ambassadors, even Moroccans got bored, and why would Iraqis or Egyptians watch that only because it was kind of exotic to them. So television content begin, began to change quite a lot. And suddenly Islam became very important because Islam would be something they have in common from Morocco to Iraq to uh, France or wherever. That would be one of the few things people would have in common across the region. Uh, so a lot was suddenly invested in Islamic programming. 
there were a few channels. This is Hezbollah's channel, Al Manar. Hamas uh, also has a channel, Al Aqsa, that you probably heard of. Uh, so these were kind of political Islamist channels, which would uh, be just uh, the mouthpiece of a particular party. And they emerged already in the uh, 1990s, uh, here with Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of, uh, Al of uh, Hezbollah. And this is Al-Aqsa with its uh, famous or infamous children's programs where there are warnings against the Jews and so on. Um, but here comes the first real Islamic channel. It's called Ikra, which means read, and that's the first revelation to Muhammad, uh, or the first word Muhammad heard from the angel uh, Gabriel. That was set up by Saudi, uh, a Saudi entrepreneur, Salah Kamil, in 1998, I believe. And that was the first of what is now, I think, somewhere in between 50 and 100 religious channels. Uh, Arab religious channels. There are five, six Christian religious channels, but apart from those, the rest would be Islamic. Um, and Ikra became an instant success, and some of the people who featured on Ikra became stars. And stardom is something you don't really traditionally have quite that way in Islamic uh, culture. Muslim ulama, Muslim uh, scholars who all of a sudden became so interesting that magazines would write about who is he married to and, and all these kinds of things that suddenly came up. <coughs> so we have maybe 50 stations, um, but we, of course we also have Islamic programming in other stations which are not fully dedicated to Islam. Um, and we have new uh, figures, the Da'iyah, as they are called, the missionaries uh, who were uh, propagate Islam, men and women. And then we have what I call Islamization of TV formats. Instead of who wants to be a millionaire, they had a hugely uh, popular program called who wants to be a missionaire. So they would compete in just how good they were at explaining I Islam. Or instead of uh, beauty contests, they had a famous, in, on Ikra, they had a famous beauty contest for women with a hijab who would tell about just how much they had sacrificed for their parents or something like that. So it should be the goodness of and the, the beauty of the person who should be selected. So this was obviously taking formats from somewhere else and Islamizing them. That's what I mean about it. <coughs> And often, of course, showing that there are ways of doing things Islamic. This is very important to the Islamist movement from the 1970s onwards, to tell people that there's an Islamic alternative, there's an Islamic way of doing things, there's an Islamic way of uh, saying hello, there's an Islamic way of dressing, there's an Islamic way of banking, and so on and so forth. And, and television could be good at that, showing that there are Islamic ways of having a cooking program, then it's about the prophet's favorite dishes or something like that. All the time they were looking for children's programs, women's programs, all the formats they would need and see how they could Islamize them one way or another. So of course you get a lot of children's programming about uh, figures in the Quran, uh, maybe about the animals that are mentioned in the Quran and so on. Uh, there would be a lot of uh, fantasy involved. They've been pretty slow at developing this, but it's it's on track and it's popular with many children. But some of it is also too moralistic for many children. Um, here's one of the most famous uh, missionaries, uh, Amru Khalid. How many of you know him? So seven, eight of you know him. It would be difficult to live in the Arab world in the, in the zeros without hearing about Amr Khalid at one point or another. Uh, and as you can see, he's also kind of commercial in the sense that he has set up many organizations doing uh, benevolent work in Africa or uh, teaching poor kids to read or something like that. Many of the uh, initiatives that you would also know from American televangelists, and this is of course something scholars have tried to compare, the American tradition of televangelism and this new kind of Islamic televangelism. And they would often focus on a man like uh, Amr Khalid, uh, 
who is, as you can see, not your typical sheikh. He has an education in insurance, um, as you might even guess. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, he's very eloquent, and he speaks a lot about how he feels Islam is something you should feel. It's not just just rules. It's something that has to do with your own personality. And this kind of uh, slightly more pietistic, perhaps, uh, Islam had a lot of uh, sway, I think, especially with younger generations who were tired of the kind of fire and brimstone preachers you would also often see in the Muslim world. This is Al Qaradawi, the, the man I edited a book about. Uh, he has his own program. How many of you know him? Maybe even more. No, it's more or less the same people. Uh, he is an Islamist sheikh. So he's a real sheikh who has the education, uh, uh, Islamic education. And uh, he's Egyptian, but he spent most of his life in uh, Doha, in Qatar, where he has been the most uh, important preacher. And when Al Jazeera, the most uh, uh, the most seen news channels uh, channel was set up in '96, he got his own weekly program called Sharia and Life. And this Sharia and Life, that's the same idea that he wants to say that the Sharia is not something venerable that we can sometimes go and look at. The Sharia should be with us all the time. We should devise Sharia ways of living modern lives. That's what he and his movement are uh, about. He's also a very political figure uh, who's been very critical of the West and Israel. But when the revolution set in, he was also extremely uh, critical of the Arab, uh, or he had been for some time also prior to the revolution, critical of Arab autocrats, such as Mubarak in Egypt or Al-Assad in uh, Syria. And he even called for the killing of some of them. Uh, so he's a fairly controversial man, but he was born in 1926, so he is uh, almost 90, and probably we can consider him a spent force by now, but there's no one quite like him in the Arab world still at the moment. He's a very different guy. Oh, there are some of you who know him, I can see. <laughs> uh, his name is, do uh, you remember? Yeah, uh, Ahmed Shukairi, and he's on NBC, which is the biggest and most successful TV network in the Arab world. It's based in Dubai, and he has these programs called Khawatar, which means kind of s small thoughts, uh, uh, and they are they are short program and programs, and they are uh, he's kind of a hipster, if you can imagine an Islamic preacher hipster. He would be one who comes close. Uh, <coughs> I watched uh, uh, 30 episodes when he went to Japan some years ago, and that was quite interesting because it, uh, he liked Japan very much, he and his crew, and sometimes he, they would make the split screen and see, now we are standing here waiting for the bus in Jeddah, and it was supposed to be here, but in Japan it would be here right on time and so on. So it was very often meant as a criticism of things in the Arab world which don't function or are more corrupt or something like that. But we'll quote from the Prophet demonstrating that the way the Japanese have organized their lives is much closer to our ideals, our Islamic ideals. So there was a very significant element of self-criticism, Arab self-criticism in his programs. It's very popular. Uh, yeah? Okay. Uh, this is another very popular preacher. Um, his name is Tara Isuwaden. And he's an Islamist of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, type. We had, uh, we had a very big crisis uh, 10 years ago in Denmark because a newspaper published some cartoons, as you probably remember. Uh, I, was a Danish, uh, I was a director of the Danish Institute in Cairo at the time, so I had to go on Arab television and meeting these guys and debate with them, which was very hard because my Arabic isn't that fantastic, uh, and they were very self-righteous at the moment. Uh, and then he and Amar Khalid uh, came up to Denmark uh, because they had criticized uh, the fact that Danish embassies had been attacked and torched. And they said the Prophet would never let 
his wrath go that far. He would be more self-controlled and use it to explain what true Islam is. They, they, they wrote this in the newspapers, they made big ads. So we thought, good, finally we can leave this violent face and move on. So we invited them up to Denmark for a debate, but it misfired due to this guy. Because uh, when he came, and we thought that it would be a little less uh, sort of uh, vitriolic, the way he would speak, we were wrong. He were extremely hard on Denmark. And the reason we realized was that he was actually launching his own television channel at that event in Copenhagen. Called, uh, the television channel is called Al Risala, and it's the uh, richest of the Islamic channels. So it was launched, and that when he was sort of knocking at me. Um, but now he's been fired because uh, the owner of this channel is Prince Walid ibn Talal, who is the richest man in, uh, in the Arab world. And uh, he can no longer have an Islamist of the Muslim Brotherhood type with him because he's a Saudi. And right now, Saudi Arabia is, uh, uh, is uh, trying to condemn the Muslim Brotherhood as terrorists except for in Syria, actually, but they are having a slightly contradictory policy on that. So he was fired a year and a half ago. Speaking of generations of television, these uh, Ekra, which was launched in 98, El Risala, the one I just spoke, spoke about, which was launched in 2006, they were overtaken by new channels, which began to appear in 2007, 8. Uh, often again claiming that it was due to the cartoons and they had to defend the prophet and so on. But these channels were Salafi channels, which is a more kind of Puritan conservative version of Islam that you would find in Saudi Arabia. But many of the Salafis aren't too happy about the Saudi kingdom either. And, uh, and these, this one, the most powerful of them, is Egyptian and Nais. Uh, and, uh, they are much more conservative, and you can see they also dress rather differently from the way, or and their beards are very different from the kind of uh, preachers we have seen so far, who were kind of trying to project a modern image, uh, and uh, these are uh, not at all like that. They also have a female channel, the kind of feminist dream that women do everything, but of course because there must be no man around. Um, and a lot of new channels have appeared. I will spend the rest of my talk uh, talking about these special television dramas that you have in the Arab world, the Musal Salad. Uh, these are dramas of 30 episodes because they are broadcast in Ramadan every day or every evening, typically, because as you know, people will be fasting during the day and then they will typically sit in front of the television to, to hear when, they, when the sun has set so that they can start drinking and eating. So you could imagine how fantastic an audience this would mean to, uh, to commercial television. You have the whole population sitting there waiting and so on. So the ads that come just at sunset are the most expensive ads you have in the Arab world. And the, the, uh, the television stations, they spend practically all their money on that single months. They are preparing it all, all year round. So what you have here in America at Christmas, New Year, uh, you'll have to multiply it a couple of times to see just how much concentration you have television-wise on Ramadan. Yeah, Super Bowl. Um, and uh, there are approximately 100 serials per year. Uh, and for a long time, they were all more or less produced in Egypt, which is also the big producer of films and movies in the Arab world. But from the 1990s onwards, with the new satellite television channels, you needed even more Musal Salat uh, to fit into all these channels in Ramadan. And it became a great uh, race between the Egyptians and the Syrians. And over the last five to 10 years, the Gulf has also started a significant production itself, although often with actors or directors from, say, Syria. And even now, with the Syrian civil war going, they are still producing these Musal Salat, amazingly. Um, 
But that is, of course, a fantastic thing for, um, or used to be for the state. This was when you had your whole population benched and they would watch the same thing. So this was a way of inculcating certain ideas, patriotism, how should we treat women, how should we treat the elderly, and so on. This, this was so powerful, especially for the Egyptian states. And there's a famous book about it by an American anthropologist, uh, Abu Lohot, called Dramas of Nationhood. But she wrote before satellite TV, or she published it long after, but her fieldwork was before satellite TV. So she hasn't really seen what happened uh, in that book. And now we have this enormous uh, production. <laughs> there would be lots of Islamic elements in these dramas because Islam is so important in Arab social life. Uh, it's, uh, of course, uh, there would be weddings, there would be uh, childbirths, there would be rituals and so on. Uh, there would be the way people speak, uh, how much religion do they weave into their language. It can be quite a lot, I can tell you. Uh, but uh, there would be different dramas. The most common dramas are what they call social dramas, about something current, about a man who is divorced and is looking for a new wife or, uh, or about uh, whatever. Uh, and there might be Islamic elements, there will always be some, but it might not be very important. Uh, but then you have real historical dramas about certain figures in Arab history. They would tend to be much more. And the Islamists have tried to make what they call clean drama, where a man and a woman cannot be alone if they're not married, uh, and uh, you would never see her uh, without uh, uh, the uh, headscarf and so on. This has generally failed. Arab audiences have felt that this was uh, somehow too doctrinaire. Um, so there are two different types of uh, Islam. <laughs> there are those which tell the holy history, of course. Like we have had big films in the US about Moses or uh, Jesus or something like that. We have that also in Arab Musal Zaled. Although depicting the prophet himself has been a kind of taboo and his wife's. But for a long time it was also a taboo to depict other prophets, but that seems to have fallen now when they do that. Uh, then you have saints in the Islamic tradition, uh, either Sufi saints, uh, sort of more mystical saints, uh, or great figures of Arab theology or history. Uh, so you could make a biopic about such a person. This is done every year. Uh, and uh, a special genre is the anti-extremist uh, musalsal about uh, modern social life and how it's being threatened by jihadists. Here's something, something uh, of the holy history. Uh, often these have been produced by Iran which has a tradition of depicting prophets and holy figures more than uh, than the Arab world, but then it's translated, uh, dubbed into Arabic, and sent by Iran's own Arab channel. They have uh, several Arab channels, but uh, all by, for instance, Hezbollah's channel, which is one of their allies. Uh, and it's, of course, interesting to see what do they do with these holy figures? What, what kind of take do, you, do they have on then imagine that it, this is 30 episodes, typically of 40 minutes. So if the Quran mentions some people two, three places, it's not quite enough. You'll need more, you'll need many legends about these persons. You might have to add some figures, although this can be tricky, uh, like a servant or someone close where you can see how they interact with people and you'll have to invent small dramas that the servant uh, ran away for this or that reason and how did he react and so on. So they have to embroider on something. And this is, of course, what Puritans may not necessarily like. <laughs> then you have the really big, a very expensive historical drama like this one about Omar, who was uh, the uh, cousin of Muhammad uh, and one of his main allies uh, in his uh, wars and later became the caliph. 
this was an extremely uh, uh, expensive, the most expensive Moselle cell uh, in 2012, produced uh, in the Emirates, and maybe uh, also in a way as some sort of response to these Iranian series, uh, the Iranian are Shia, and they uh, don't consider Omar the hero. In fact, they have a very negative view on Omar. Uh, so producing an Omar series also has kind of a sectarian dimension to it. At least that's how it was felt this year, because sectarianism, Sunni, Shia rivalry was on the rise. Uh, uh, here is uh, the biopics of saints. Uh, this is uh, about Abu Hanifa, uh, one of the uh, an Iraqi, or long before the country Iraq uh, appeared, uh, 700, uh, he lived in the 700s uh, and founded one of the law schools of the Islamic tradition. And why do you make a, a, a film about him? Maybe to show how tolerant he was of Christians and Jews, for instance, it could be these kinds of messages that you would like to convey. Uh, but we'll have to watch it to see what's what's in it. Then there's the role of Islam in social dramas. This one was also in 2012. It's called Sister Teresa, and it's about uh, two uh, girls who are found one in front of a church and one in front of a mosque door, so left there as as young, and then they grow up in different lives. And maybe one was actually a Muslim who became a Christian which is a very uh, uh, sen sensitive issue, and maybe the other way around. So there's a lot of play on gender roles and religion, because Egypt is very divided, as it were, between its Christians and its Muslims. Uh, so this is one way of, of trying to take up these kinds of uh, uh, pretty sensitive subjects in a way which could be so engaging to people that you might have a chance to move them a bit on these issues. Then something new which has interested me is that now you also have uh, biopics, that is portraits of modern Muslim sheikhs. Um, and uh, uh, this is of course, I'm very interested in anti-clericalism, how, how, how religious figures are being depicted in public. Do you make fun of them? Can you have jokes about them and so on? How, how should they look like and so on? The interesting thing about these ones uh, is that they are made in Egypt by that handsome man down there. It's the same man you see in the three photos. He was a lover boy of Egyptian cinema in the 1950s, 60s, uh, Hassan Yusuf, who then became very devout and Salafi. And the girl he's kissing there, Shamsuddin, Barudi, she was also a very beautiful uh, star in, in Egyptian uh, film, but she also began to don the hijab. If you, if you Google her or, or YouTube her, you'd see how uh, there would either be kissing scenes or scenes where she's sitting in full niqab and telling why she's, she's been donning the veil, but it's the same woman. Um, and they are some of those who do this kind of clean cinema now, uh, not the kind of racy cinema they once did, um, and uh, depicting various religious figures from 20th century Egypt. Then there are the anti-extremist Musal Salat, uh, which can be very violent because it's about how young men are lured into terrorist cells. They are protesting against this or that in, say, Saudi Arabia or Yemen uh, or Syria, uh, but find out that they are actually being exploited by elderly sheikhs who, it turns out, are actually doing it for money. They are having women on the side or, and so on. They're not at all what they appeared. Um, this one to the left is a series from 2010 about the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, Hassan al-Banna, made by Egyptian state television, that is under Mubarak. So it's pretty critical of Hassan al-Banna. Uh, it wants people to know Hassan al-Banna, not quite the way the Muslim Brotherhood itself would depict him. But on the other hand, he's too big a figure just to 
just to say that he was an idiot or something. So it's it's a little bit more subtle than that, but it's clearly a very political uh, musel cell. Yeah. Um, there are the historical dramas. Uh, these, for instance, are about uh, some of the great uh, Mamluk heroes or Ottoman heroes and how they ruled. Uh, and that's, of course, interesting that you make these kind of things in autocrat regimes such as Mubarak's Egypt or Assad's Syria. Here will also be messages about the good ruler and the bad ruler, al mustabit al mustanir as they would say, the enlightened despots. Um, I'd better end this now. Uh, Here's uh, Saladin, whom I'm sure you all know, the most famous Muslim ruler at the time of the Crusades, who defeated the Crusaders uh, and uh, conquered uh, Jerusalem. There are numerous Musal Salad about him. Uh, every third year, there would be a Saladin uh, Musal Sal. Uh, but they can be slightly different. Uh, here were two in the same year, 2001. But one of them is called Searching for Salahideen. So it's about the Palestinians today and how they would need a Saladin. Uh, because what Saladin did was that he established himself in Egypt and united Egypt and Syria. And, and thus he could squeeze the little crusader kingdom in Jerusalem. And this is actually what happened in the 1950s when Egypt had its most famous modern president, Nasser who united with Syria. And the most famous film of the period is called The Victorious Salahedin, and Nasser Salahedin. Nasser means victorious. Uh, so about how Nasser was the new Salahedin. And that's what they are often playing on. These are very nationalist uh, films, but, and that's it. You can make Salahedin a, a modern Arab nationalist, or you make, can make him a great Islamic ruler so who do you choose? Where are you placed in this kind of battle for hearts and minds, as it were? I thought I'd end with a couple of clips, if I can make it work. I think you could see what that was. Yeah? The birth of Jesus. It was the birth of Jesus. This is the gospel, uh, in, according to Islam, um, where Mary gives birth to Jesus. She's also a virgin in the Islamic tradition, somewhere east of Jerusalem. Uh, but the other guy, you see, the one who's co totally lightened up, that is Zachariah. Uh, one of the prophets, and that's why Jesus also looks like this. They won't, don't want to depict the face of the prophet. Um, he knows, because he's a prophet, that it's happening. And 
if you go on, you can see that they're struggling with how it's a little bit unfair, of course. They, people here have been watching many, many episodes of this, so they are emotionally much uh, more into it than you are. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is a culmination of, of the series, uh, that she has been vilified and so on, because nobody believes she's a virgin and, and so on. She's had a very hard time. And you can see how, how when they depict her, her they, they will end up doing exactly like you see here in the, uh, in the National Gallery. A medieval Christian uh, Mary with the same blue and white. You see her pick small uh, white flowers and so on. All the kind of iconography we know from the Christian tradition because you don't have an iconography in the Islamic tradition. And how do you make a miracle? Well, special effects. <laughs> That's how uh, Christians have made miracles in their religious films. So when God speaks to her in a little while, I should maybe have shown you that, he will have this deep voice of, uh, what was his name, Charles Don Heston or so, who, uh, who spoke in, in the, in the uh, Cecil B. DeMille films. Uh, they, they will have to employ an artistic or uh, cineographic uh, language, which is actually employed from another tradition. You will see a bit of the same here. This is about one of the most important Egyptian preachers in the 20th century, uh, and he's praying. Ah, sorry, what happened here? Uh, doesn't it work? So he's praying at night in Cairo, next to the Hussein Mosque. was that? Saint. Yeah, the saint, he's, he's praying so hard uh, and then one night when he's been praying and fallen asleep he has a ru'ayah, he has a vision of a saint uh, who says why are you straying away from the path that God has given you and so on, you must, you must keep on fighting and that's, of course, what happens when he wakes up next morning. He's kind of reinvigorated. But then in a later episode, we meet that man because uh, this, this uh, sheikh, Egyptian sheikh, is invited to Algeria. Uh, and this is the Algeria of the FLN, very socialist and atheist and so on. But they have a big problem. They have a big uh, drought. It hasn't been raining for a long time. Um, and... Uh, um, then uh, he meets this uh, uh, sheikh, a Sufi sheikh, and uh, embraces him, and they know they have met each other in this Ru'ya. And then they start praying the very special Islamic prayer for rain, Salat al istisqa And all the other engineers and doctors are laughing, all the modern Algerians, but then <coughs> suddenly, of course, it starts to rain. So they have proven them wrong. And here, last one. This is from Sakfel Alam, a very complicated series about uh, Ibn Fadlan, an Arab uh, who traveled north in the 900s, sent out from Baghdad by the Caliph. And uh, in the north, he met a people he calls Rus, who are extremely primitive. Um, 
and he des describes them, and we have always considered this, we've known this source for 150 years, that this is an early description of the Vikings made by an Arab. Um, but this was taken by an American author, very well-known author, Michael Crichton. Uh, he, he used it as an inspiration for a book called The Thirteenth Warrior, where Ibn Fadlan goes up with these primitive people and helps them with all the skills of an Arab gentleman, with all the knowledge uh, and science that the Arabs had at this time, which, of course, the primitive Vikings did not have. And it was made into a film with Antonio Banderas, that maybe some of you have watched. Now, this was all stolen by a Syrian scriptwriter, Hassan Min Yusuf, to make a story about how this Ibn Fadlan came up to Denmark. It's made just after this cartoon crisis. Um, and then he civilizes the Danes, always quoting Muhammad, and the Danes are, of course, incredibly uh, barbarian, but there are some even more barbarian people nearby, and he helps the Danes conquer those uh, people, but all the time by quoting the Prophet Muhammad. So here you see him uh, leaving in the 30th episode. This is his farewell. Uh, so imagine you've been watching 30 episodes of 40 minutes of this uh, again. Um, so it's more emotional than you'll just... Um, taken in northern Syria. Yeah, you see how it ends in modern Baghdad. So where's the barbarity now? It's kind of made a, a, a tour from claiming that uh, the Danes are the barbarians till at the end he actually considers Denmark a fairly civilized place. Uh, he was very proud of that. I invited him to Denmark, but uh, that's another story. I think I'll end here with these examples of uh, modern Arab television drama and the role of Islam. <laughs>